Welcome to the course summary. We've covered a lot of exciting material, and now let's go and break it down step by step and summarize some of the things we've covered. So in lesson one, we talked about the introduction material, also the goals of the course. So a few things to be aware of here is that uh, you really should go through and study all of the official material from AWS. This is really the, the official guide. These types of white papers, uh, for example, and also diagrams and videos that are available from AWS training, these are all gonna help you uh, to be successful on the exam. Now, in lesson two, we went over data security. And this is really a fundamental concept that you should be aware of just in your career as well as for the exam. And in terms of data security, a few things to be aware of are the KMS system. Uh, if you haven't really in, in depth covered the KMS system and tried it out and experimented it with yourself, this is really gonna hold you back and it could prevent you from passing the exam. So I would definitely recommend uh, doing this uh, in, a, in a real scenario. Another thing to be aware of is just the concept of encryption itself. So, uh, you know, do you know uh, how to encrypt something? Uh, have you actually gone through and looked at the white papers that AWS has covered on encryption? And also, when you're encrypting data, are you thinking about, is it encrypted at rest? Is it encrypted in transit? And also, who has the keys to decrypt that data? Another thing about data security to be aware of is also access control. So uh, when you think about access control and you think about AWS, uh, ideally the IAM system is really the central place where you're going to have those controls. And if you remember in the IAM system, we have the concept of uh, machines that have access to things, we have users that have access to things, and we also have uh, individuals that have access to things in groups. So you know those different uh, categories of access control are really important to be aware of. Another aspect of data security is also not storing uh, customer data that is confidential. Uh, so if we go through here and, and we look at uh, you know, a, a customer that uh, potentially has uh, credit card data or has social security numbers or any kind of uh, really personally in identifiable information, when you're looking at customer data, um, you should be aware that uh, in some cases, it may actually be a violation of a federal law or a, or a state law, or if you're dealing with something in uh, Europe, there may be a, a, a different uh, set of regulations there or the medical profession. So are you aware of all the different aspects of how a customer data uh, record should be stored, what parts of the record are personally identifiable? And these are really important concepts to know. And, and I think in general, when you're studying for an exam like this, you should be thinking in two phases. One, you know, you want to pass the exam, but you also, can you absorb this information and you, can you apply it when you go to the, work, the workforce? Now, data collection itself in lesson three is one of the most fundamental concepts of big data. So if you think about collection, you know, it's really about uh, batch and also about streaming. So if we look through here and we break down the differences, if you remember, batch is something that happens, uh, it could happen, let's say, one time a day, right? And if it's streaming, it's basically continuous. So an example of this uh, would be, you know, maybe water, right? So if you, um, if you go through here and you uh, have a water bottle that's delivered to your house, you can go through and, and you know, periodically uh, grab a glass of water, drink it, uh, and that's more of like a batch-based process. But a streaming-based process would be that you, know, you have a hose running, the hose is literally running all day long, and then whenever you wanna get a glass of water, you, know, you go to the hose and you drink right out of the hose. And really, that's probably the best way to summarize this collection concept. And depending on that batch base or that streaming base approach, there may be different ways to deal with the data. So uh, EMR in particular has a couple different categories uh, of, of utilities that can deal with this. So in the, in the case of uh, streaming data, you may want to consider Spark. And so Spark actually has facilities for both um, data engineering and also facilities for ML that actually can work on um, streaming data, right? And in terms of batch, there may be other services that are more appropriate. And so in terms of batch, maybe you want to use a service called AWS Batch. And this is really important in terms of all exams from AWS is do you know 
the capabilities of each technology that's available on AWS, and can you apply those technologies when you're asked an exam question. Now let's go into storage a little bit and talk about different storage solutions. One key uh, question to be aware of is the concept of a database. Uh, the CTO at Amazon had published a paper that was really interesting that talked about these different styles of databases. So, you know, there's DynamoDB, uh, that's one. You also have uh, a regular relational database, so the RDS system. You also have the concept of a cache-based database. Uh, and there's, there's other databases as well, like, for example, a graph database. So can you actually understand the best use case for each one of these databases? So a DynamoDB database, for example, is a key value database. And so that's great for documents or for doing um, you know, really uh, distributed uh, computing where, where throughput is really important. In the, in the case of RDS, that's a transactional database. And so you know, that could be better for, let's say, uh, financial transactions. In the case of a cache, a cache could actually be something where uh, millisecond response is really what's important. A graph database, it could be social relationships. So are you actually using the correct database and, and, or are you choosing to actually uh, shoehorn everything into, let's say, a, a, tr a traditional relational database? And you can absolutely expect that someone would uh, want you to know these differences. And if you're asked an exam question, that you're going to know the difference between, let's say, a graph database and a, and a DynamoDB database. So really important to know that in terms of the database. Also, uh, we talked about this as well, this concept of you know, a lake. Right, this, this concept of a data lake. And there may be no more fundamentally important uh, concept when, when you're talking about big data than to be talking about a data lake. And the reason why the data lake is so important is that the data actually is processed inside of the data lake. So let's take uh, SageMaker. So SageMaker will actually pull the data from S3, it'll train the data, and then it'll put the data back into S3, a trained model. Uh, also, they, these data lakes have essentially infinite compute. So uh, you don't have to worry uh, about um, dealing with you know, um, your own physical data center that may have limited capacity. You have infinite compute in the cloud, and that infi infinite compute can operate on your data lake. You also have the concept of infinite storage. And so with infinite storage, you also can go through here and, and also never worry about running out of either disk I.O., so the ability to actually read in and out data, or also worry about actually the storage itself. So this data lake is, is again, probably the most fundamental concept to be aware of uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about big data, and also to think about how services work. So you know, if somebody asks you a question about how would I do machine learning and how would I create a machine learning pipeline, I think you should also be thinking about the data lake, right? So, how is SageMaker, for example, or EMR going to get the data? Well, they're going to get it because it lives in the data lake. And how are they going to process it? Well, they're going to process it on the data lake. And how are they going to create that artifact or that trained model? Well, they're going to put the trained model back into the data lake. Uh, another aspect of data lake that's important is also the authentication and authorization as, as well. Um, so also to know about um, these, these security aspects uh, of a data lake as well as like, have you actually thought about who should access what parts of the data lake and how to control those resources? So a few really interesting um, uh, areas there. One other thing about storage that's kind of interesting is also to talk about um, warehouse. And so uh, if you're gonna talk about a warehouse on the AWS ecosystem, most likely you're gonna be uh, referring to Redshift. And the key difference with Redshift versus let's say RDS is the, the fact that it's a columnar store. And so a columnar store allows you to do things like count petabytes of data all sub-second, right? So that might be another interesting uh, tidbit to just keep in your mind is that uh, really a Redshift database is specifically designed to deal with counting really large quantities of data. And so make sure that you understand Redshift Make sure you understand those properties and how it's different uh, conceptually than a traditional relational database. Now, in lesson five, we talked about processing. And in processing, what's fascinating about it is that it's really uh, the concept of compute. 
And so with compute on AWS, there are many options. Uh, and actually some of them are fascinating options. And let's, let's talk about a few of those. My personal favorite compute option is AWS Lambda. And what's interesting about uh, AWS Lambda is that AWS Lambda is this concept of a serverless or it's a you know, function as a service um, uh, platform. And so what a function as a service is, is it's literally a function that takes something like an X and a Y, uh, it does some kind of processing, and then it returns back a result. And the result could be uh, really those two variables actually added or plused or something like that. And so this is uh, uh, an important concept to know is this you know, essentially um, serverless technology uh, ecosystem. And serverless is basically pervasively um, spread across every single part of AWS. So if you're talking about storage or you're talking about um, you know, a platform or you're talking about compute or you're talking about machine learning, anywhere that you would need to use um, a technology serverless is, is basically waiting there for you. Uh, another uh, layer above that is going to be the container layer. And this is really an emerging trend here is this uh, concept of containers. And on AWS, uh, really it's a Kubernetes-based uh, workflow uh, that is, is probably going to be the most uh, prevalent uh, workflow that involves containers. And you'll need to know about the Amazon uh, Kubernetes service. And Amazon Kubernetes service allows you to actually run and more manage uh, at a Docker file level uh, some of the characteristics of your workload. Um, and so that's really the, the lightweight computing. And then if you get into more heavyweight computing, then you get into the concept of EC2. And with EC2, really the two main uh, components to be aware of are you have these on-demand instances, and you also have the concept of spot instances. And with a spot instance, the real takeaway there is that you can use these for uh, essentially pennies on the dollar. So with a spot instance, uh, you can go and grab, a, let's say, a GPU-optimized instance, and, and you can personally perform uh, deep learning, or you can do uh, big data operations, and you can control exactly what happens. And these spot instances actually can feed into uh, uh, Amazon MapReduce, or they can feed into, let's say, AWS Batch, or they can feed into your own uh, customized uh, big data workload. In lesson six, we talked about analysis. And analysis, really a few big takeaways are that uh, you should be aware of tools that can do things like descriptive statistics, and also be aware of uh, tools like SageMaker, and also be aware of tools like Athena, like anything that can go through and uh, perform some kind of analysis operation. Lesson seven, we cover visualization. And, and in visualization, really the one big uh, takeaway is uh, Amazon QuickSight. And so Amazon QuickSight does um, basically point and click uh, visual, business intelligence, and you should be aware of any kind of a visualization tool that uh, would be used in a real world scenario. Besides QuickSight, another thing to be aware of is also using Python-based uh, visualization libraries. Uh, and some examples of that uh, are Plotly, uh, another one is Matplotlib, uh, another one is Seaborn. Um, and these are libraries that they're, I guess, tentatively associated with uh, the whole ecosystem, but they're important to use as a study mechanism. In terms of case studies, uh, one thing I rec would highly recommend is actually practice. Uh, it's, it's something that really um, is important to do is have you actually practiced all of these different components? So have you gone through to the data security uh, system and played around with IAM? Have you gone through the collection system and used Kinesis yourself? Have you written some code and talked to it? Have you gone to the database and, and used it for RDS? Uh, have you gone through and used AWS Lambda? No substitute for practice. And also, the, again, these um, white papers. If you look at these um, white papers, uh, there's just no substitute for understanding that knowledge. And finally, with uh, lesson nine, exam prep, a couple things to, to really take away here is one is that um, it's okay to fail the first time. And in fact, I would even recommend um, that you would actually assume it, it that you're going to fail the first time and uh, assume that you can pass the second time. And with this type of approach, it's really a meta exam strategy where basically you want to pass the exam 
and you're okay that you have to take it twice. So if you go in and you take the pressure off yourself, you may be really just kind of doing a dry run and you could get lucky and pass the exam and then you're really ready to prepare to pass it on the second exam. And I've used this a lot when I'm, when I'm helping students prepare for an exam like this and I feel like it's a, a, a strategy that isn't talked about enough. Now let's close with the future. What's gonna happen in the future uh, of big data? In the next five years, companies, all companies, are gonna be involved in the software industry and that's really one of the best emerging trends. So AWS, Google, Azure, these cloud providers are gonna be closely integrated with all companies in the future. And so as a big data practitioner, if you can really master all of this technology and you can apply it to your company, you don't have to necessarily be a software as a service company, you could be a regular company that is actually utilizing this trend and leveraging that uh, pattern. So it's definitely a great time to be an expert in big data and I encourage you to pass this exam and also continue to grow and, and learn those skills in the future.